Hello and welcome to the video. This is a slightly different format. Uh, as you know, I've got to figure out which way the, the screen's working. Oh, there we go. That's Jack. Uh, Jack is one of the hosts of Let's Drone Out and most of you in the UK, if you're into multi-rotors, will know who Jack is. If you haven't tested, checked out the LDO podcast, I'll put a link in the notes below. But the reason for this session, and it's going to be a little bit different from the way we do it normally. Normally, you know, I kind of go and spend loads of time editing and putting in graphics, and that's what not absolutely what this is not about. It's more like two blokes having a chat down the pub, which is very much in the style of LDO. And this session is to kind of cover the stuff that Jack wanted to talk about on the Mini Air Show 6, which was an online virtual Mini Air Show at the weekend. That was the 16th, I think it was of may and jack had a session all lined up to kind of follow on from my session earlier in the day talking about the best way to get answers and unfortunately because everyone else overran always works that way on this kind of thing uh, jack's session was really truncated so we're doing it again because actually you know what me and jack talk about this stuff a lot is that fair jack i, I and cry to each other and, and cry to yeah, yeah. Ge ge generally but be bemoan and how much trouble some people can get into by not knowing how to troubleshoot and that's what this video is all about again no high production values it's just me and jack having a chat and the reason that i want uh, and i'm kind of excited to be here with jack to talk about this is that troubleshooting is a little bit of a lost art back when uh before things like ipads and stuff like that if you were into computers you had to have a level of knowledge about how the computer worked because if you didn't then at the first sign of something going wrong you were snookered and you had to have usually the there's one person in the family who knew how to do computers who was the person who always got the call i was that person in our family so whenever something didn't quite work right the sound stopped working the mouse was misbehaving that application wouldn't start properly i was the person they called so Knowing how to do things under the covers with computers and troubleshoot issues, whether it was fixing a computer, um, figuring out why your car wouldn't start, those were kind of common things. These days, a lot of that complexity is hidden away behind, behind very sweet, clever, nice-to-use graphical user interfaces. So these days, we do talk about that joke about if something doesn't work in computers, turn it off, count to 10, turn it on again. And while that fixes an awful lot of problems generally, including my washing machine last week, but I won't get into that, the the issue with the radio control is that, uh, they're too clever by their own uh, for their own good now because it's a computer, isn't it? So turn it off, turn it on again. Um, but the challenge with a radio control issue is it might be you've wired something incorrectly. It might be a solder joint is broken. It might be that something isn't getting the voltage that you thought it would. It might be a voltage regulator's busted. It might be that you've managed to put a screw that's too long into the back of the PC. But there's a million different things that could mean that your build doesn't go as smoothly as the ones that you see on my channel and other people's. So this is to talk about all of that. And hopefully at the end of it, you'll be a little bit more prepared if you do bump into a problem to get it sorted out. Now, the first mm -hmm. thing I want to talk about with Jack, um, and we've talked about this a lot, is the symptom isn't the problem. Where, and what I mean by that is, if you are trying to arm your quad and one of the motors doesn't turn, but the other three do, it's not the motor that's broken potentially. It might be, but there's actually loads of other things in between the sticks on your control and that motor that potentially have gone bang. And what I see an awful lot is that people will see that the motor doesn't turn and say, okay, well, it's obviously the motor's broken and start desoldering things. And before they've even had a look at stuff. And have you kind of had experience of that, Jack, with stuff that you do? Because I, I know you you've built hundreds and hundreds of quads in your time. Yeah. Um, so the, the, way, the good way to look at it is that everything follows like a line or a flow chart. Depends on how you look at it. And like you said, the very beginning, you know, one way of looking at it is like there's a battery and then there's a battery in your <laughs> in your controller. And then, you know, is your controller switched on? Is it sending a signal? Is that signal getting to the receiver? Is that receiver then sending it to the flight controller? Is the flight controller putting it out to the ESC? And then is the ESC, <laughs> is the ESC working? And then it gets to the motor. So, yeah. And um, I quite like the fact that you mentioned our phone calls because... 
Now and again, we will phone each other, and that comes to something later on called a sanity check, where <laughs> you can't work it out, and you think, am I going mad? And then you have a phone call with Lee, and he, you know, or, or, or someone or who's... Do the, or, or do the way around. I sometimes ring yeah. you going, let me just check. I'm, yeah. I, I, I'm not losing my mind here. Yeah, and, and then he goes, oh, yeah, uh, didn't, you, didn't you hear the hear the note on that, that, um, that Free Sky's locked you out? The, the famous... Can't update this Tyrannus. <laughs> oh, that that yeah, that was a very good one. <laughs> EU EU law, um, but yeah, so that's that's kind of what was the question again? <laughs> so we were talking about the symptom not being the problem. Um, yeah, it's very but, very often the case. It's, so so the 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 thing that you're seeing isn't necessarily cause a problem because another one, a classic one, I had this one the other day. Um, I get this question a lot on the YouTube channel. In fact, I had another one this very morning as we're recording this. Uh, my oh, motors sure. don't turn. What is problem with 12 exclamation marks and a question mark? All in uppercase. These are always in uppercase. But fist smashing the keyboard. And... <laughs> Absolutely. And and you can you can you can feel the frustration behind that simple request. But uh the one I had a couple of days ago, I kind of went back and I talked about a few things and I said, Yeah, because you've armed the quadcopter, haven't you? And he came back and went, Armed? Question mark. And I went, ah. Okay, we we found the problem, and sometimes it isn't that you actually uh, either have got a, um, a model that has a problem. Sometimes it's not because you have built it and made a mistake. Sometimes it's because you're missing that one single step between it working and it not. And something like arming, which if you, you you're not used to the multi rotor world, a lot of videos don't talk about. You have to arm the quad. Mm. Um, if you, and, and no. just catches just people like out. Yeah, so there's when you when you first start, there's uh, the 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 hardest part I found was vocabulary, and I was funny enough joining the um, RC world. I was just a little bit before I started properly training to be a mechanic, and vocabulary is everything. Being able to and and I'd already learnt that skill, and then when I went to mechanics, and I always those two like things kind of like married up and went together so if you ingest everything and even if you haven't got working quad sometimes it's nice to go out with people who are flying and you'll get the sort of like uh accumulative knowledge of like being around in that thing and getting the the whole sort of like vocabulary and that will help you talk and like figure stuff out because in a way you already know about arming if you say own a car because when you arm a car it's put your foot on the clutch and then start uh, turn the key. So the foot on your clutch is the pre arm <laughs> or lowering of the throttle. So it passes more on threshold. Uh, more about that later. It's one of my favourite notes, and uh, that's if your quad isn't level enough, i.e., not in your hand and not on the floor. And then when you turn the key, that's your arm switch. So it's all like yeah, you, you know it. You just don't know you know it. <laughs> It, it is, but it's amazing when you come into the hobby how often you will watch videos uh, about a build and some of the things that are so incredibly basic, everyone almost assumes that that knowledge is is there and it, and it genuinely it genuinely isn't. And, yeah. and, and troubleshooting is just as much about what you know as, uh, as what you don't know and knowing where those gaps are and not being afraid to ask the question. Um, I think it's worthwhile going through how you and I troubleshoot problems because you know we, we we both mess about with radio control equipment on a regular basis, and um, I'm weird in that I love it when something goes wrong. So, uh, for example, there's a video that I put up today about getting um, wireless trainer function working with a four-in-one multi-protocol module in the radio. Now, that's not new; that's been around for ages. I wanted to play with it. Uh, read the stuff online, which was lightweight. Let me say that as as, as a sparse. generous way of putting. Yes, very sparse. That's a lovely way of putting it. <laughs> so I, it, so it's either really sparse because it's so bleeding obvious that it just works, or it's sparse because it's one of those things that it's a little bit on the raggedy edge of the art, the possible, and you never know which is which. So I tried it. And guess what? It's on the raggedy edge. So I figured it out three and a half hours later. You and I had a chat about this earlier in the week because I was pulling my hair out at one point. That does actually happen to me. I do get frustrated. And then eventually 
it all burst into life. And it was like, brilliant. Now I figured it out. Now I know the version numbers, the tricks, the tips, the things you've got to do, the receiver number stuff. I can make a video about that because I know if I'm trying to do it, there's probably a couple of hundred other people around the planet, probably a, a, almost at the exact same time, thinking, how do I do that as well? But yeah. going through that process and trying to get from you know something that has seven lines written about it on the internet <laughs> to actually having it working on the desk, there's a load of things that we go through. Um, so before we get to the idiot um, factor, um, let, let's talk about some of the really basic stuff and the thing that probably saves my bacon 80% of the time. And that is good old Mark One Eyeball visual inspection about actually looking at the piece of kit before you plug it together or before you start unsoldering stuff is literally just un undo the cover so you can actually see mm. all the electronics and work your way through. Um, funny enough, I was having a conversation about this with a instrument technician called David Powell. He's one of my good friends. And uh, also a thing that will help you in life is always be friends with people that are smarter than you <laughs> and it will hold you in good stead. <laughs> Whether, that's why I'm terribly afraid of Andrew slash Frank, but because <laughs> it's what it's scary how intelligent he is. Um, he's a smart cookie, but he, he, he argues, um, like step, step one, like, like NCIS, there's two like number ones and, uh, his number one was rule one, check that there is actually power. And um, and Frank's number one, like who well, I share with him as well, is um, make sure there is a problem. So um, and that kind of leads on to the the second thing of like, you know, uh, replicating the issue, uh, the 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 problem as well. But yeah, you can good stead is like visually inspecting, but. Um, the only downside with that is sometimes you do have to take things apart to get a really good look at. But yeah, like you say, a loose motor wire that's going from the motor wire to the ESE because obviously they're spinning props, take yeah. a knock, a dry joint as well, which is, um, you know, insufficient thermal displacement. That's the word I was looking for. Right. Well, who cares? <laughs> yeah, uh, bad connection. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, and like it kind of like led on to the sort of like, you know, yeah, a, vi a good visual inspection is like your first tool because it's with you. And then sniff, you know, if you see something that's burnt, um, it's quite good as well. Uh, but yeah, use all your senses, like touch things, wiggle them, get a pair of tweezers and like, you know, does that join and it is connected. The other thing is smell something. You can always smell if a motor's burnt or the yeah. magic blue smoke. Everything in theory is fixable as long as it hasn't been on fire. That is true, and and I I love the smell um, yeah. comment because it, because it is if if you have cooked something, there is a there is an undeniable a warm electric smell. Uh, that was my phone. Apologies for that. There's a warm electric smell, and if you if you kind of um, if you can figure out which bit you've cooked that's probably a part that you're definitely going to have to replace. And there may be other parts either side. So going back to where we started about does my motor turn, you know, step one from Frank is, is there a problem? It might not be there is a problem. It might be that you're missing the arming sequence to arm your quadcopter to make the motor run in the first place. So great place to start. If it, with a visual inspection, you can make sure that you've actually wired it up properly, that you've got the servo connector or or whichever, actually soldered onto the right leads of the quadcopter. You can make sure that uh, the power is getting to the ESC and that the power pads that you have got everything connected to actually have the battery voltage. Mm. There's some really, really basic things. And in my experience, that by doing those handful of things, including you know looking for stuff that's scorched, lo looking for stuff that smells like it's got too hot, so that almost like melted plasticky smell, will, give, will get you down to the issue 80% of the time and we haven't used any you know advanced oscilloscopes you know kind of iron man level of technology yeah. we've used the mark one eyeball your nose and maybe a multimeter just to test simple voltages yeah. around the circuit when it's powered up so the the first rule check power or you know the first rule make sure there is a problem uh check power switch on to dc voltage if you're not familiar with a multimeter you can buy a really cheap one. You don't have to buy a fluke or whatever. 
Um, like I said about the the whole like um, ingest everything, things like e EV blog and places like Big Clive. Although Big Clive's just putting LEDs together like most of the time and playing with cheap Chinese tat, you're still gonna learn. You'll be surprised like what you learn. Like you know, our oh, diode only lets voltage through one way, and like you know, um, and and like Lewis Rossman, you know, he talks a lot about. He's a guy who fix, fixes MacBooks, and you know you may love Windows, but he he's um, self-taught with electronics, and um, he he like breaks things down very simply with like current. It's like what you know voltage is the you know the the sort of like stream of water, and to measure the current, you wouldn't know how you know how fast the stream's moving unless you put your hand in the water, and like beautiful little things now and again that he always always says and that kind of like helps you you know like look for knowledge in the most unlikely places and um slightly a bit off tangent but check there is power stick it on dc and then the other thing the big the big number one thing really is even before you do that stick it to continuity test your probes should give a beep if you don't have a beep uh what it's measuring is resistance and it should say open circuit because you know you touch them together, but that will will tell you that things are connected. That will help you with dry joints and stuff like that. And make sure that the electricity is going to where it should be. It's a really good point about the multimeter, though, and we definitely need to talk about that. If you're in getting into the hobby and you're going to do this in any way, shape, or form, and you haven't got a yeah. multimeter, spend the sixteen twenty quid to get yourself a cheap and cheerful one. Uh, I wouldn't get the real horrible cheap and cheerful five quid ones. They're n not worth. Yeah the paperweights but for 20 30 pounds you can get a really nice one and it will save you hundreds and hundreds of pounds through the through yeah. its life and hundreds and hundreds of hours of being really annoyed i very commonly ask the question what voltage is getting to the camera in the kind of troubleshooting that i do with people on youtube and the answer invariably comes back um i don't know how do i test that and they yeah. haven't got a multi and, and we're, we're kind of dead in the water at that very simple step yeah it's um in in the the thing is with this is that um once you buy it you've got it for life unless someone steals it um like Gavin Ferry I'm watching you um we know where you live uh, yeah um you know and this will help you in other things you know relative comes to you ah my toaster's not working you can check the see if the fuse is working in five seconds with one of these it will you should by law not be allowed to ha own one of these unless you've got one of these <laughs> so you know and yeah so these the you know these three things i can pretty much maybe four i can pretty much fix most things <laughs> yeah I, I would agree with that so so let's assume then in, in this example of our motor that isn't running we've done the visual inspection everything appears to be connected uh we have checked the power's getting through it uh you know what's the next thing we do and and the next thing i would do is start to try and identify all the different pieces between me and that motor. And just like Jack said, we've got a motor, we've got the wires connecting it to the, and the connectors to the ESC. We've got the ESC power, we've got the ESC being connected into the motor out of the flight controller. We've got firmware on the flight controller. We've got a radio receiver. We've got a wireless link back to the radio and all of those separate pieces. And it's a case of, well, how do, how do you break down an issue? Because, for some of you watching that will have been oh yeah of course that's how it works but for lots of people who are asking these questions getting stuck you know i probably lost them when i talked about esc so you know the first yeah. part of the hurdle and going back to jack's point about the language you know this is with any discipline there is an associated language that comes with it lots of three and four acronyms radio controls are exactly the same as anything else uh, yeah. unfortunately it is a barrier to entry but if you're going to be in the hobby you just have to learn it um yeah. and you know once you've spent a couple of happy evenings watching videos and stuff and using good old google you'll understand exactly what's going on yeah. lots of basics rc basics on my channel talking about what an esc is what a bec is what's the difference between the two how they work uh you know what voltage is current all that stuff so th there are lots of places that you can go where it's explained relatively simply but now yeah. let's talk about breaking it down to the individual parts yeah. i mean what what tips and tricks do you use jack when you're trying to troubleshoot and find the actual cause of the problem uh but um a good thing about the the vocabulary is uh gary the guy who taught me um 
at, you know, mechanics and stuff, he said, uh, you know, like the the way you talk to people or like get help with, um, you know, like the the with the problem as well, or ordering parts is that you know you you've got to like know like kind of what you're talking about to get your problem across. And he was saying if you phone someone up and be like, yeah, it's a you know the the four sort of cycles of an engine: suck, squeeze, bang, blow. If you talk like that, you know, it's not necessarily like you're talking to a professional. It's like you know. Um, induction, compression, power, you know, and and um, yeah, and that kind of exhaust, and yeah, you know, it would that sort of like helps the person know that you've kind of know you know know what you're talking about, but um, or done your basic research, which is yeah, again, but, another big thing that when you're asking for help, people want to don't want to feel like they're your first port of call. Uh, they want yeah. to make you know feel like you've at least done a little bit done of good work. work. A little bit of legwork, and to be honest, we're going to talk about Google searching and a bit yeah. of Google foo at the end because yeah. that is when I get a question that I don't know the answer to. That's how I go and find it out. Yeah. So back to that that question. Um, so we're on to the part of isolating the problem, and my the the biggest headline underneath that is the word consistency. So um, what you want to do is remove all the variable, like you know, uh, things that are sort of like. Mm, you know, for ages, I was using a bench power. Uh, I was using a bench battery pack, which is a large, crusty old 3S. And I was using that. And eventually, a couple of times, I'd be working on stuff. And then my board like, would be the only thing that would power, power up or it'd start flickering. And it was because the battery was low. And then I would then not realize and then start trying to diagnose another problem. Like, have I shorted something out? And it wasn't. It was the battery that ran out. So Frank um, bought me a lovely bench power supply. So a bench power supply gives you consistent, um, you know, consistent power supply. You can limit the current. So if you have got a short there, it won't just continuously pump out current like a battery would. And it means that I've got a constant um, source of power from the wall. That's if the electricity board doesn't go down. And what I've done is I've stuck. This goes into the power supply. I've stuck an XT. To, uh, XT60 on the end of it so much so because I use it mainly for RC if I need to break it out I've actually put <laughs> XT60 <laughs> to crocodile clips if you need to tackle it but anyway is isolating the problem so like you say you take different parts out of it you or you just check those parts so one way you can do it motor's not working um, you can go over to the receiver tab if you've got your receiver on and you move the six to see whether it's getting the signal and then, but then you're not sure whether that signal is getting to the ESC that would involve an oscilloscope to see whether the PWM signals are going. One way to easily bypass that is just go to the motor tab, make sure the props are off. Always rule one in, in, in the RC world is remove your, your props. Take your props unless off. You want to cut, um, unless you want to cut your dick off, as AVE would say. He's also a good another one to watch. And then spit, check the box, and then spin the motors up. That way, um, you know, with the slider, and that way you know that there's a signal definitely going from the flight controller to the ESCs. And if that's not happening, then you know it's in between the ESC and the motor. It, it is because by doing that, you have taken out all the receiver, all the flight controllers. Eliminated. Stuff. You've, you've eliminated a half of the stuff in between you and the motor. Now, yeah. there, is a, there is a simple methodology where when you're troubleshooting, you can swap components over to find whether or not the problem stays with the component you're moving or stays where it was originally. So say, for example, one of the arms on the quad cop so this motor isn't running, then what you could do is you could swap that motor with one of the motors on the uh, one of the other arms that is working and then if that same arm the motor still doesn't run you know it's not that it can't be the motor because that's just come off the other arm it's yeah, probably going to be working. some that was working it's probably going to be the esc now you have to be a little bit careful with this in that you don't want to keep putting in 
so say the say the motors um, that some of the windings are short circuited or something you've done something really really horrible or your motors failed you don't want to keep putting esc after esc after esc on it to try it because they'll mm. probably those escs will probably get fried as well because they're not designed to output the power into a short circuit they're designed to energize a coil but that is a very cheap and quick and easy way for you to kind of swap things around and to see where the problem is so yeah. that's what i would do um, but going back to the power yeah. issue, uh, let, let's yeah. talk a little bit about that, about things like smoke stoppers and things like continuity testing and things on the power. Um, yeah. We, we, we hear about, and I hear about the magic smoke an awful lot. So for those of you that are uninitiated, the magic smoke is what happens when you've made a mess of your wiring <clears throat> and you plug the battery in and instantly there is a little put like, like the genie coming out of the lamp in Aladdin, there's a little puff of smoke that curls up out of your whatever you just built, and you immediately pull the power connection apart with that awful sick feeling in your stomach, uh, but it's too late. The component we, has already overheated and it's damaged. Should we give a visual um, a visual example of the magic smoke? We can. If, if you've got something that you can sacrifice, yeah, that, no that would be awesome. Um, You've got to also, describe the smell. <laughs> yeah. So, slightly back before the like you were saying about the um, you know swapping the ESCs, do that if you've got no other way of testing. But a good little handy thing that um, he would say like buy an extra of everything and something. Or if you've got a friend who crashes a lot and has like random spare parts, just take one of them, and make a few little tests or old boards, keep hold of them. This. And you know some other things as well: a spare motor, a, a, a spare a PCB, and a spare old fl flight controller. These are known good testing. Last time I used them, they were known good work. And like you say, if you do swap things around and um, something is damaging that component, like you've got a rogue ESC that's like you know just straight line bypassing current and and da damaging killing motors, it stops it from doing any more damage so in a way you you get two two benefits out of doing this one is you're not messing with something that's already working and it removes the element of potentially damaging more stuff so yeah, it's always that's... some spare change and some old parts like you know if you go to bring and buy or swap or whatever and you pick up you know you're like i'm never going to fly this crap but it's good to have on the back burner being like it does work and that will tell me why something's not working it, it it's a really good point and and i have a whole box full of old stuff um speed controllers motors uh from stuff that i've retired that have been ripped out planes that were so completely damaged i've just taken them the servos and everything for that exact same reason i know that i know that esc is good it's not going to be one that if it does go bang i'm going to be really sad about but um but yeah you'll when you start out you don't have a lot of these things but once you've been in the hobby for six months you'll find you'll end up with this little pile of, of bits uh, and just keep a track of which ones are the good ones that you can swap out so you're just about to cook something and show the magic yeah, smoke here, so, right ready three two one and, oh no it's overcurrenting me damn it right Okay, so, so the bench power supply has just saved our bacon there because normally if that had been a battery, that would have been yeah. dumping as much current as it could push let's, through the... the let's get a battery. No, all, all right, okay. Uh, where is the battery? <laughs> Three, two, one. Oh! oh smoke. Oh, it's okay, so... Um, what where, what will be that over there now? I, I the, the weird thing is I can smell it even though I'm yeah. you know, we're two hundred miles away from each other. Um, there is a very unique smell of uh, fried electronics. Um, not a lot of smoke with that one actually. It's usually the capacitors yeah. that give a really good. Um, I think it's gone, but brother. Yeah. Oh, oh, blimey, Charlie! Don't do your battery. Uh, doing things like this isn't great for your batteries either because it pulls an awful lot of current. Way there we go. That's the magic smoke. <laughs> Lots of it. <laughs> Woohoo! Um, it, yeah, you... it vaporized the terminals as well, which was right. quite cool. There we go. So, so that's probably hundreds of amps going through that for a very short period of time that has just 
basically destroyed all of the tracks and everything else. Um, it will it will stink now. Poor, uh, thanks, Jack, for doing that. Bless you, because you're no, going to have to sit there and smell that for the rest of the uh, rest of this session. Fine. Um, quite used to it okay so so uh, let's talk about error codes um error codes are things that you tend to get in software rather than hardware you, you, uh, your esc will do things like beeping to let you know of particular issues and you can look those beep codes up but one of the things that i find lots of um, new pilots overlook is the error codes that you can get by plugging the flight control and stuff back into beta flight say you have a quadcopter and it won't arm uh, the best thing to do is plug it back into beta flight to try and arm it while it's all powered up and to look at the um, the arming flags in the first page of beta flight and actually show you exactly what the problem is. And it could be like Jack was joking at the beginning that you've actually not got the quadcopter level. It could be something as simple as that. Yeah, it will tell you with beeps. Yeah, it'll tell you, uh, but in the screen, it'll also tell you if you have a problem with one of the channels being below the failsafe threshold, all those kind of things will be covered in there. And if you can find an error code, then you can Google it. And I guarantee there will be at least 10, probably several thousand other pilots who have bumped into that problem before. You'll be able to find answers in the forum. You have to probably search a bit in the forum because there's lots of differences of opinion and lots of uh, tangenting going on. But the answer will be in there. And there's probably going to be a YouTube video or something else that probably somebody somewhere is probably going to show you the answer. Um, mm. error, error codes for me is how I fix a lot of the problems here. Uh, things I use Mission Planner a lot with Ardu Plane, and if I'm having trouble with arming, the easiest way to do that is while it's all powered, put a USB cable into your laptop, fire Mission Planner, try and arm it, and it'll tell you on the screen exactly what the issue is. Google that particular issue, it'll tell you what what, what the problem is, and bosh, you're all sorted and off you go. Yeah. So sometimes the problems aren't. The magic smoke has come out. Sometimes it's a setting in the software, but the software these days is pretty good, and it will tell you what you've done wrong. Yeah. Um, another thing is uh, sometimes you need to get to the end to tell you what's what's wrong. I know that sounds weird, but um, the you know get to the full like you know the full thing of setting it up, even though you know you've got a problem. You can you know like if you power on and then complete that complete the build and then i fully set up the quad and flash it to the latest thing or flash it to something else and then get it and then usually it can then spit back things and be like ah, i'm not working and it would be wrong not to mention constantine with inav if you've got an osd set it up even though you know ideally kind of do that at the end you would wouldn't you i do i do it at the very very end but uh -huh. I don't, but I know what you're going to say. <laughs> yeah, some some people like you know set it up, get it working, get all the the motors thing, and then set up your OSD. Um, and you know, you know, you haven't even got flying. And the the other thing I've got on my bench is a little cheap Eosheen screen. Hasn't even got antennas plugged in, but it's a way of me setting that stuff up. But yeah, mine's just there off the screen. Yeah. And it's got one of the, you know, car reverse stands that you're going to stick it to your dashboard and it's on your desk. It's really handy, but you can just use your goggles because you've got system message and that will tell you what's wrong. I.e. in INAV, I haven't got enough satellites. I'm not going to arm. Um, you know, uh, uh, what is it? Something too low? And that means that the throttle doesn't go low enough. And if you can see that in your on-screen display, if you Google it, you'll find the answer. So uh, th yeah. there's lots of stuff around. The, the trick with the trick with troubleshooting, just kind of round this piece out, I'm conscious we've been going for 35-odd for, for minutes now, is that Sorry. what you need to do – no, no, this is a great this is great chat. I mean, you and I could talk about this for hours, bro. Yeah. Uh, if, if you break down the problem that you've got to the five different parts of the problem and you can test each one with known good stuff or swap it out, then if you test all – if you test four of them and they're okay, the last one is almost certainly going to be the problem. Or there's actually six parts of the problem and you've missed one, and that's the actual part of the issue. Being logical and working your way through it is is the way to do it. And once you've been in the hobby a, a little while, there are common gotchas that you will find that we've all had numerous times. Most of the pilots you bump into will have numerous times, and they will be the problem most of the time that you're getting. Having things like you know, your motor not spinning might be due to the fact 
that you haven't got the right motor protocol selected in beta flight. More likely, yeah. it's something to do with the way that you've wired up the ESC and motor. Yeah. Um, it, it, that, so that's typically where you, you start in the basic stuff. And again, that's why we're saying you start at things like, have you got a problem, visual inspection? Because you will see that I've had a problem with somebody that motor wasn't turning, and that's because they couldn't find the, all the screws that came with the motor. So they'd used a longer screw to screw it in. And the motor had gone right up into the can and was yeah. actually pressing onto the onto the rotor. So it yeah. actually had locked the motor in position. It was mechanically unable to turn. Now, if they'd have done a simple visual inspection, just tried to spin it by hand, they'd have immediately spotted that they that the screw they'd used were three millimeters too long. And that's yeah. why you you start there, not with oh, am I using the wrong D shot protocol? Yeah. So um, yeah, good little tip about the screw. Like when you first build a quad is you'll end up with loads of like different different screws sizes and stuff and and what you can do is a little quick inspection is hold the thing so that's your carbon fiber and then hold the screw up and see how far it it protrudes and stuff like that but you're getting into the ter territory of what i like to call sanity check and but let's let's do sanity check now that's yeah a so like, yeah like sanity check yeah, and in a way, um, I I learned the hard way because after a while, you know, I, I sort of like became, you know, like worked in the industry, and then I became the sort of like person that, you know, my group of friends would like come to me and be like, you know, what's the deal with this, and you know, and and ask me stuff. And after a while, what happened for me was like everyone just assumed that I knew what I was doing, and I had a particularly hot, difficult bug to to fix, and I was getting to the point where. You know, it wasn't worth screwing in the motors properly. So I put one or two screws barely finger tight in the motor and I fixed the problem. I was like, yeah, I'm done. And I'd forgotten to visually check, like we said, you know, the first thing, Mark 1 eyeballs. And back in the day, when you're a newbie or, you know, you're, you know, a regular quad flyer, you build your quad, you'd hand it, mate, what do you think of this? You're like, oh, I've got this new. And you'd have this sort of like pre thing check. But after a while, when you start flying with the guys and you're out and you're hitting spots and you're just, you show up and you, you rip and you fly and you move on to the next thing. And people, I stopped have, getting that sort of like, hey, what do you think? And they're like, oh, well, you built another great quad. And there was never that sort of step there. I, it bypassed the step because they were like, oh, Jack's got it in the bag. And it's not, like you say, if something isn't working, there's two reasons. A, it's you. You're the problem. The problem, the common thing with computers is the problem exists between keyboard and chair. And it's usually, you know, I've messed it up. And the, the other thing is, you know, it's difficult because you're trying to get into someone else's head on how this works. You know, if you were left alone on Desert Island and you were building quad, you would have built it completely different or, you know, that old sage thing. But that's that that is the that is the thing is like yeah so, sometimes you need a fresh pair of eyes and you also suffer things with f fatigue and frustration if you've been working on a problem too long you can no longer see the wood from the trees and if you're tired and you need to break there was a thing that you know gary the guy who taught me mechanics always said is to find a place where you know where you are so I know that sounds strange, but um, like when you're taking things apart, there's something called like geometry of parts where you take things apart and you lay it out in a set way. You know, this screw came from the top right corner. So I'm going to get a blank bit of paper, draw how it was, draw what, you know, a, like a square and put that screw in that corner. And then, you know, and stuff like that, like lay it out. It's, um, there's also a sort of thing called knolling as well. It was the name of a janitor who would go into an architectural um, space and he would tidy things up. And the way he tidy it up is he would lay everything out into different sizes and nicely laid out so you know where everything is. It's a, a sort of term with the Lego guys. But what i'm trying to say is you get to a place where you know you've taken the esc out and you put that motor and you make sure that you know that when you come back that that's the motor you're working on and these are the screws and i've also got like little i've got like little dishes 
like of of screws and i know these are the screws i'm working on for my work stuff and these are the camera i sorted out for steve (laughs) and basically that's what you mean like keep stuff together and sort of get it to a point where if i come back in 12 hours because i've fallen down the stairs i had to go to a and e when i'd come back to it i know what's going on even if i i keep millions of these permanent markers even if you write the word on the broken one and draw arrows on your desk to yeah like you know like good or screwed and if some if you have purposely you've broken something and it's definitely no good put it in the bin so you don't confuse it with the good one yeah um, uh, to, to to follow up on that uh, second absolutely yep. everything that you've just said because the, the, we used to have a joke about it's not the hardware it's not the software it's the wetware that's the problem the wetware yeah, yeah. being that be, being the pilot or the <laughs> user of in it um and you know, to assume up, you're an idiot <laughs> right, yeah and work backwards right so the, yeah. the other the other two things big tips from me is um it's very easy to get really frustrated when you are um, working on a problem and it's kicking your butt and and you know like that for example where we were talking before about that multi-protocol setup thing and it three and a half hours in my sense of humor was failing at about the three hour mark um, and then i had a breakthrough and then we were getting on but i i was at the point where i was about to put it down and walk away if you try and fix a problem when you are getting short-tempered and frustrated there's a very very high chance you will do something that will break something else. So then you've got to fix two, more two things rather than one. So when you are getting frustrated, sometimes it's hard to do because it feels like it's admitting defeat, but it's not. It's the smart choice. Put the thing down. Go make yourself a cup of tea. Go and watch a Marvel movie, whatever it is, and then go back to it the following day. Because the weird thing that often happens to me is, and my video is now frozen. frozen yeah. The first, so the big piece of advice here is, if you're getting frustrated, put it down, leave it, and don't, and come back to it the following day. What tends to happen with me is that I will have a flash of inspiration at some point over the next 12, 16 hours, and I'll I'll think of something that I haven't tried, or I'll be just mooch around the internet and, and find the post that talks about the ex- exact problem I'm having, and when I go back and ha- have another go. The other big tip I'll give you is when you're taking things apart, take photos. Before you unplug and unsolder stuff, take photos, yeah. take numerous photos. It's amazing how often, as part of taking the photo, you will realize, oh, crap, that's not good, and you'll spot part of the problem. But similarly, when you're putting it back together, if you're not sure where the white wire, the yellow wire, and the green wire goes, you will have a visual reference, particularly if you aren't the person who's built that model in the first place. Last thing to talk about then, and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap this up, so thank you to everyone for sticking with it so long, is talking about google foo and google searching because you're like me everyone assumes that we wake up with an encyclopedic knowledge of all things radio controls and that we have all that information at our fingertips and it just doesn't it uh, let's let's dissuade everybody you know let's clear up this confusion it doesn't work like that we we play with the stuff on a regular basis but half the time i get a question on youtube I have to go and do some Googling to either find my old video on that subject and refresh my memory or to do a Google search to find the manual because guess yeah. what? A lot of the time the answer is in and I'm not going to RTFM, but I kind of am. A lot of time the stuff that you're interested in is covered in the manual about how you set that up. But also there are things like FAQs and gotchas. And just by searching, you'll find it nine times out of ten. Two things I'm going to cover is, yep, uh, read a manual. You don't need much, but it does lead into the keep keep your little board notes. And the other thing is, yeah, notepad, common things like KISS VTX. Is the standard high or low power? You know, like the, <laughs> is the switch up or down? Notes like that. Um you know, the boot button falls off and like what pin's too short to get it in boot mode if your button's fallen off. And um, uh, uh, press of the short, boot, left guys, manager, STM, DFU, update, mandatory, uh, um, yeah, ma- thing on, yeah, they're sort of like boot commands and stuff. But yeah, common gotchas, pin layouts and different ways to wire them. So you just kind of... You know, you just number the pins. Square pins are number one. Um, but there is something I'd like to call the art of Googling. There's 
few people that I've 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 met in the world, and Frank's one of them. So there's there's ways, you know, the speech bubble, the the speech quotation marks, the yeah. quotation marks. That's the word. You can use that to highlight the important bit, and that also comes to the vocabulary. If you know what it's called, or like the common issue sort of motor won't start is um. You know, like you know, for instance, or motor, you know, twitches, or the the correct term is hunting. You know, when the the motor goes, where it's like missing a phase. But yeah, like if you type in like motor is hunt, you know, uh, rushless motor is stuttering. You know, like because you wrote brushless motor instead of what kind of motor is it? Brush, brushless. You know. Um, yeah, like the, the key words, like try different words, you put things in brackets, you can also eliminate, um, for instance, I was searching for LEDs, and now if you type in LED, you get a lot of searches for TV. So if you use the <laughs> minus key, TV, for what you don't want to search for, that reduces, you know, so you can keep doing that. You know, like, say you're looking for a... a, a a kiss problem and you keep getting beta flight results minus beta flight. And sometimes by adding the name of a, a somebody or a, um, a, a, an expert in inverted commas again, uh, the, <laughs> 360, the, you'll the find YouTube. is, then, yeah. no, well, it does, it does, but but you know, there's me, there's Bruce, there's loads of people making good content that actually yeah. is designed to help people, not just talk about why this late is latest goggles are fat shark killers. If mm. you put the name, so say for example, you want to search for how does it, how does ESC work? If that you want, if that's what you want explaining, if you put something like Painless Street sixty at the end of that, it will automatically show you all stuff from Painless Street sixty or yeah. XJet or Andy RC or NJ Tech or Curry Kitten. Uh, and I'm just trying to think of everyone that's on LDO. So if, yeah. if you put if you put their names at the end of the search you're looking Curry for, it, it thank you. It will also kind of give you their stuff first because some people create content and write articles and videos designed for newer pilots. Some people don't. I do a lot of that. Other YouTube channels will maybe assume that you've already kind of watched all that stuff. So when you find people that you who's pitching stuff at a level that you're understanding, you know, you can also yeah. add that into the search term as well. Yeah, um, that, that kind of leads me to the sort of thing. Um, don't forget the way you ingest information is different. Some people don't get along with videos because they keep charging your head and you can't stop and focus on the thing. So if you find uh something like oscar lang that's more the blog kind of reedy style you know if you like to just see it all written out and you know each the steps visualized by the scrolling of the page if you find something like that make make a book mark list make playlists on youtube if you get on with someone that you know sort of like like i was saying about lewis rossman because he was self-taught he sort of like got a very very sort of like basic way of of, of like breaking things down yeah, it's very hands-on. Playlist. Nothing worse than watching uh, watching something, you know, being like, oh, this looks like an interesting video. Watching it, it, it shows you how to fix the problem. A couple of months down the, down the line, one of your mates runs into the same problem, and you want to send him that video, and you can't find it. Save it. Make loads of, you know, I've got a playlist on my channel, useful t things. There's like a click kiss playlist. There's a... Um, and and there's a, a, a iNav playlist, things that I found useful, and of of and the way the way that's good is that I've I've definitely learned something on there, so you know that there's something in there that's good. So um, I've I've got just the the two more slight Andy RC rants that will be quick. Is number one, like you say, when you're frustrated and stuff, don't write. This is a tip I learned from you. Don't write and ask for help when you're angry. But my my sort of thing on that is pay, pay it forward and pass it on. You know, um, if someone helps you, like their posts or you know, be be a be an advocate of like them and be like, this is a good person. They help me, and that person will appreciate it. There's nothing worse than being like ungrateful or giving them a hard time, and then they're less likely to help someone else, and it just doesn't help the hobby. And if someone's helped you 
you help someone else and it, it just passes it on because that person you you get them in the air and you know there might be one of these people that if you didn't get them in air in the air they never fly and then they never p- be on part of the hobby and then they never run on run into someone who then needs help and then they don't it's all a, a cumulative error of if you don't help each other out and you don't help people get fly there's less people in the hobby there's less, less information going around and you know it's we're all in this together you know it's all the like hive mind of enjoying the hobby and together we're like really powerful and the last thing i'd say is even if you feel like you're not winning and you can't fix the problem and you can't like get this bit of tech working and you end up having to refit or replace you know don't forget about the 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 right to repair you know all this apple stuff you know like be part of the you know i fix it you know tinkerers hackers crowd and like own your stuff but even if you can't fix it you still learn something you know you've learned how not to do it or you know you've you've put an extra couple of hours into soldering so you are winning even if you feel like you're not and and not enough people when they get something sorted then document it and share it with the community even if it's a post in a forum or some pictures or what it's you know you don't have to have a website you don't have to have a youtube channel uh because that post may be the difference for somebody coming along after you between them giving up on the hobby and uh, yeah. getting over this problem and getting back in the air and getting a big smile on their face. So yeah. just uh, you know, to reiterate what Jack said, if, uh, if you fix something and you figure something out and it's something that was bugging you, I guarantee you are not on your own. There's going to be hundreds yeah. and hundreds of other pilots in the same boat. So uh, you know, be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Help people. And uh, if you, just if you help. notice there isn't a resource out there, you you're you're gonna have to step up and be that person like for me get kiss uh no in, in uh, impulse rc cha- kept changing the camera plate design and everyone was like oh how do i fit that and if it falls on you step up you know just make don't matter how shitty the video is you know whatever as long as you get that information out there you know it it all builds on the mountain of rc no, I think that's a perfect way to, to end it. So thank you, everyone, for hanging around. We're going for about an hour now. Hopefully, that's been a fun way to spend an hour. Um, I'll also I'm, – I'm, I'm going to edit this in a minute. I'm not sure whether we'll do it as just a, an audio with the inserted image of Jack blowing up a, um, a flight – was ESC, was that you smoked? Um, yeah, ESC, yeah. Or whether we'll just kind of we'll just keep it at ears with all the rough edges. So uh, again, you know, it's a slightly different format this, but hopefully that was interesting. And if you have other things like this that you'd like discussed, then do let me know, and uh, hopefully we can kind of come back and do other subjects. So be nice to each other, pass it on, and as always, happy flying. Thank you for watching my video and watching right to the very end. If you want to find out what I'm currently working on, you can follow me on social media by searching for Painless360 in the usual places. If you'd like to become part of the inner circle, then you can become a Patreon. Details are in the description and you get lots of additional benefits. Check out the playlist section on the channel too. I organize all of my videos into playlists and it's called something like Introduction to Author Beginners. All of the content is aimed so that you can start at the very beginning and it teaches you that subject, starting with simple principles and moving up to teach you everything you need to know.